morning. Uh, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund and our co-host, the Foreign Policy Research Institute and the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, I want to welcome all of you to today's discussion on the new Eurasia energy landscape. Thank you for being here uh, early on a Monday morning. I hope everybody had a, had a great weekend. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our panelists, including officials from the U.S. government, from <coughs> Europe, private sector representative, think tank partners, energy sector experts, for participating in what I hope is a, a conversation today about an, a timely and important topic. My name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund here in Washington, D.C. I served, previously served uh, before, being, uh, before coming over to JMF uh, at the U.S. Agency for International Development as the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia and worked closely and on the topic of energy proje projects across Europe and Eurasia and had an opportunity to work closely with many of the panelists uh, here today and some of those who've, who've come and are sitting in the audience as well. I also work closely with the State Department, uh, National Security Council, Department of Energy, uh, and so I'm very excited to see Jonathan uh, Alkind here today uh, to uh, participate in this effort. And I've also had the opportunity to work with the EU and also uh, many partners in the Black Sea region. We have the Georgian ambassador here, so thank you uh, for coming and participating as well. For over 40 years, GMF has been a leading voice on both sides of the Atlantic to strengthen transatlantic relations, democracy, economic prosperity, and energy diversity, security, and independence. GMF's offices and programs, including in Brussels, Eastern Europe, and the Black Sea region, Ankara, Bucharest, Warsaw, and elsewhere across Europe, are on the ground leading the debate on the economic security and geo geopolitical importance of increased transatlantic energy sector cooperation and energy independence. Today's event and the focus on the new Eurasia energy landscape is timely. In a time of great uncertainty and increased political and economic pressure in Europe, especially from <laughs> Russia, our mutual security interests, prosperity, and future is tied to deepening energy sector and technical cooperation, including efforts to create more integrated markets, diversification, energy, energy efficiency, and independence. All these issues are critical for the US, Europe, especially for those partners in the Black Sea region, like Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, that seek greater Euro-Atlantic integration and energy resiliency, and are especially vulnerable to Russian energy ma manipulation and hybrid warfare. Today's conference is a rare opportunity to connect pipeline geopolitics that surround issues including Nord Stream 2 and U.S. LNG exports to Europe to ongoing energy sector reform supported by the U.S., EU, and IFIs across Eastern Europe, including the implementation of the third energy package and energy assistance projects. The conference today is an opportunity to assess and better understand challenges and provide short, medium, and long-term policy recommendations to strengthen energy security and prosperity across Europe and bolster U.S. European energy sector cooperation and trade. This effort needs to include all of the key stakeholders at the table. We also hope today's event will be a platform for innovative and forward thinking that will enable us to tackle and stay ahead of emerging trends, for example, digital disruptions and cyber attacks. Again, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. I want to invite Maya up to say a few words as well, and Mamuka as well, to uh, say a few words of introduction. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, good morning, and welcome, welcome to GMF. Um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. My name is Mayo Tarashvili, and I am a research fellow and program manager at FPRI's Eurasia program. Um, FPRI, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a Philadelphia-based think tank, foreign policy think tank, uh, that is based on a premise that a nation must think before it acts. Uh, so we aim to educate the public and the policymakers, and we do so with uh, our robust programming, including uh, the Eurasia program. The Eurasia program has over 24 
um, Eurasia experts who are based uh, all over the country, but also all over the region itself, the Eurasia region itself. Um, the, the program includes things like the Black Sea Initiative and the Baltic Initiative, and we're able to, to uh, narrow in on some of the issues that we find to be very important for U.S. foreign policy and strategic interests. Um, that includes things like looking at Moldova a little bit more closely, looking at the Caucasus region a bit more closely. Um, so that's why we were able to launch Moldova Monthly, the Caucasus Tables, the Baltic Bulletin, but um, also very importantly, the, the Black Sea Strategy Papers, which um, are all overseen by our research director, Chris Miller, who is here today. Um, so I would like to welcome all of you to check out fpra.org and see the work of our organization, who is dedicated to offering ideas and fresh insights to uh, the American public and policymakers. Um, we're very pleased to be a part of this conference today, and we are very grateful to our co-sponsors, GMS, Monica, and also the co-employees of Caucasus Institute, uh, Monica Zereteli. So uh, let's welcome Mamuka so he can uh, say hello to our panel. I would like to join my colleagues uh, from uh, German Marshall Fund and Foreign Policy Research Institute and welcome you all for this uh, conference today. Um, Central Asia Caucasus Institute, which is part of the American Foreign Policy Council, is leading institution that tries to uh, advance knowledge about West, West regions uh, stretched from Eastern Europe to um, Central Asia and beyond. And we try to uh, advance uh, ideas, um, connectivity uh, between countries uh, and people-to-people uh, -people connection. And most importantly, we try to uh, bring uh, knowledge about the region uh, to, uh, to Washington as, uh, as, as well as elsewhere. We have uh, bi-weekly publications, uh, Central Asia Caucasus Analyst. Uh, we have Turkish, Turkey Analyst, some other um, uh, major publications called still called uh, paper series. And we hope that this conference will contribute to a uh, better understanding of uh, emerging new dynamics in, uh, in uh, energy landscape of, of Eurasia, where uh, countries of Central Asia and Caspian region have major roles to play um, going forward. So I'm looking forward to our discussions today. Thank you. So as you can see, I think we have a really exciting program today and, uh, and the bringing together the, of the three different organizations to focus on this region, uh, I think highlights the importance of, of what we're hoping to uh, get out of this conversation today and hopefully uh, take with us and also to policymakers ideas how to move forward on these key issues. So I think what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna, we're gonna move into the first panel, panel number one, so if I could ask our uh, panelists, our colleagues, to, and some of them are my former colleagues, to please come up and, and join us up here. And uh, I think Yannick will, will need you as well. And so I just want to make a reminder to you that this is all on the record as well. And so I hope that allows us to have as free-flowing a discussion as possible. And we look forward uh, in this panel to all of your questions uh, and answers, uh, and the answers from our panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna welcome everyone, our panelists today. Thank you so much. Uh, some of you have traveled afar from uh, Vienna uh, to be here today. And, uh, and I think as it was advertised, this panel is gonna focus on the US, the EU, and energy sector reforms uh, in the Black Sea region. But of course, I think uh, when you look at the history of the work of our panelists, and we were talking earlier, I think the combined energy experience in this sector uh, is uh, three quarters of a century. Um, obviously your, your experiences are, are particularly important. So we have a, an incredibly distinguished uh, panel that includes Yanis Kopach, who heads the Energy Community Secretary of based in Vienna. Uh, we have USAID's Director for Energy and Infrastructure in the European Eurasia Bureau, Steve Burns, and Will Poland, who's the Senior Director at the US Energy Association. 
Uh, while at USAID, as I mentioned earlier, I had an opportunity to, to work with all of our three panelists, and I really deeply appreciate uh, your willingness to come here and, uh, and to participate. And really kind of excited, because I think this is a real opportunity to talk about uh, uh, assistance and technical assistance and uh, development and reforms in the energy sector, which I think really is something that, uh, that we in Washington need to do a better job of elevating, uh, because it's been critical, reforms in the sector have been critical uh, for the last two and a half decades uh, in terms of U.S. policy, not only just in this region, the Black Sea region, but in Central Europe and across Europe. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that today. And that's what uh, sort of drove me to this, uh, thinking about this panel when we talked about with our partners about hosting a, an energy conference. And I look back at uh, just at USAID alone, uh, in 25 years, what had been accomplished and achieved in transitioning countries across Central and Eastern Europe um, and the economic impact of transitioning these countries to market economies, uh, but also the struggles today with countries in the region uh, like Ukraine, uh, countries that have advanced uh, considerably over the last decade, like Georgia, uh, or those countries that are in peculiar and, and maybe, maybe more difficult geostrategic spots like Armenia and the Balkans as well. So it's not a conference necessarily in the Balkans, but I know, Yanis, you're your work and also Steve, Will, and others uh, has spanned across this entire region. So I hope that you can pull out some of your uh, nuggets of wisdom and thoughts on how we, uh, how we can continue to move this forward, but also to elevate uh, assistance, because it's, a, it's right now we're in the middle of a uh, continuous debate about foreign assistance and assistance in the region uh, and whether or not uh, it's, you know, it's in our U.S. interests or the interests even of European colleagues, because they have the same exact debate that we have today. Uh, here, and how we make sure that we channel it to achieve uh, the goals that countries like the U.S. or the EU um, uh, uh, set out to achieve. How do we achieve those goals, and how do we work better with our partners in the region? So uh, I'm really thrilled that you're here today. I know I have to do a more uh, formal introduction of, uh, of each one of you, which I'm going to do, uh, and, uh, and I hope you can you know, before we, we started, we obviously we I've asked each one of you to speak to directly to your priorities, the challenges you see in the region. Will, uh, based on your experience too, you've seen this transition, and you've also seen backsliding as well. Uh, to talk about those those issues, but also talk about trends, emerging trends that we see in the region, uh, issues from cyber aggression. Uh, and Russia is also obviously looms large in this conversation. So I'm very much interested to hear more about efforts to, uh, to address Russian energy aggression. And not only from the perspective of you know, uh, pipeline interconnectors, but the nitty gritty of, of addressing issues like corruption and democracy and things that really matter in terms of the transition of economies and countries in this region, the same type of transition that occurred uh, in the very countries, uh, you know, like where you came from and where you started in terms of your political career and your and the work that you were doing, and Will that you were part of, and Steve that you've been part of. So, let me just read quickly the bios, and then we'll turn to opening statements, and then we're going to open it up to to question and answer. Again, this is on the record, so I, I really uh, welcome uh, all of your par participation. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, our first panelist is Yanis Kropach, Director of Energy Community Secretariat. Uh, he's been director since December 2012. Before taking up this post, uh, he was Slovenia's Director General for Energy in the Ministry of Economy from 2008 to 2012, where he was responsible for the implementation of the third energy package, uh, Energy IP. He served as the Ministry of Environment, Spatial Planning and Energy from 2000 to 2004, and Minister of Finance from 1992, uh, in addition to a 10-year career as Chairman of the Budget Committee in the Slovenian Parliament. So uh, I've seen it both in the executive branch and the legislative branch as well. Our, our second panelist is Steve Burns, who is currently the Director of the Energy and Infrastructure Office and the European Eurasia Bureau at USAID. Um, he has been with USAID in a senior leadership position focused on energy, energy reforms, uh, and independence for almost a decade. Uh, he has worked. He's also has extensive private sector experience. I work 
uh, incredibly closely with Steve for three and a half years. Um, I can't think of anybody better who's more knowledgeable about the current challenges and reforms uh, that are needed to be addressed in the region. Uh, but he also carries on, I think, a, a really a deep legacy of USAID's role in this region. And uh, I'm really thrilled that, that you could be here today. Our last panelist is the one I have the most written about, um, and is Will Pollan. And he, he's, the he is the Senior Director for Europe and Eurasia at the U.S. Energy Association. I think there are a few people in Washington who have uh, Will's history and background uh, and knowledge of this region and the energy sector. He's directed numerous programs with, U with USAID, U.S. Trade and Development Agency, DOE, U.S. State Department, supporting market transformation, energy trade and investment and technology transfer in the region. Uh, he's currently uh, working on two major USAID-funded uh, regional transmission planning projects that have uh, leveraged $700 million in transmission network investment. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, I, I think uh, his experience working in countries from Russia to Kosovo and across the region is so extensive. We're really looking to, your, looking to hear more from your perspective. So if we, if we can, now that I've, uh, I've sort of greased the wheels a little bit and whetted everybody's appetite, uh, perhaps we can start on a f first with, with you and pr with an opening statement, then we'll move down the row. And if I could, I'll give this to you, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks for your invitation. Hello to everybody. I always, uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Washington where I, okay, I, I cannot say I started my career, but I spent some time in Washington very, very early on my <coughs> uh, professional uh, path. And now I'm chairing this energy community secretariat, as Jonathan said, for five years. Uh, energy community, just a few words about the organization, is an international organization based on a treaty and based on the rule of law. Uh, European Union uh, initiated it or started or suggested to, to establish it uh, back after uh, Balkan Wars um, in uh, beginning of uh, 90s, um, okay, uh, 2000 and somewhere around there. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a copy of European Union, but only in energy issues or environmental issues related to energy issues as well. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, European Union is usually not very successful in this global negotiations because it is uh, very, um, I mean, it, it's not speaking with one voice usually, but um, in uh, it is very successful as, a, uh, as an organization for regional cooperation. And it is always successful when exports such a model to its neighborhood. And the energy community is one of two such uh, export products. Uh, the other one is European Economic Area. Um, and uh, energy community functions uh, approximately the same way as EU. So uh, it has its own acquis, uh, its own legal framework, directives, uh, regulations, which are adopted by Ministerial Council, the same way as in EU. And also our directives are mostly copy-pasted from EU. Um, uh, it has a ministerial council, it has this uh, permanent um, high-level group, uh, which uh, is uh, an institution chairing this or managing this uh, between two ministerial councils. It has even its own infringement procedure. Uh, like in EU, we don't have a court, uh, but uh, still our infringement procedure is relatively uh, efficient. And this is what makes uh, organization, I would say, uh, not only interesting, but also effective because uh, countries have to respect what they uh, oblige themselves uh, being members. Uh, so we have a, a stick as well, and this is important, especially in this region about which we are talking today. And uh, uh, energy community has eight contracting parties, uh, Western Balkans, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia from this year on, and um, a few observers, Norway, Turkey, Armenia. And Belarus, um, surprisingly, asked for observership status last year as well. Uh, the first, uh, I mean, uh, then one of the first uh, events after that was a visit of Russian ambassador to my office. What, what the hell is this now? <laughs> uh, 
I'm joking a little bit, but not far from true. <laughs> um, so uh, when we talk about, uh, when I, uh, you asked to, to say something about priorities, third energy package implementation in this region, Black Sea region, uh, we, uh, in the past, we were only commenting uh, uh, reforms in, in all these contracting parties. And then Maidan happened in Ukraine, then one of my colleagues said, let's go there, let's help them, let's protest and so on. And then the other colleague said, look, we are an organization based on the rule of law, we cannot help them with protesting on Maidan, there are too many anyhow, uh, let's draft them the law, uh, a gas market law. And then we did it, in the beginning there was no uh, echo, uh, but then one day when IMF conditioned um, $17 billion with the approval of the gas market law compliant with third energy package, they called and uh, they said, we would come to Vienna if we can finalize your draft gas market law. I said, okay, come. When would you come? Tomorrow. And they came. And uh, so we, we finalized the gas market law uh, back in uh, 2015, uh, January. Uh, then it was, we, we pushed it through the government, we pushed it through the parliament, uh, discussing every single amendment with all this, uh, lobbyists and then uh, it was adopted in on 6th of April. So from mid-January to 6th of April, the whole legislative process, everything was adopted and then by 1st of October that year, everything shall be implemented. Of course, it's too fast. Uh, and then we drafted them all the secondary legislation and everything entered into force on 1st of October. So it's possible if you really push but of course implementation is another story uh, as you already indicated in your introduction um, and from that time on we drafted all the legislation in electricity uh, so electricity market uh, related legislation energy efficiency related and so on for all our contracting parties and everything is mostly transposed so moldova georgia ukraine uh, uh, sorry, Georgia, not yet, but uh, Moldova, Ukraine uh, transposed third energy package fully, uh, completely compliant, uh, but uh, implementation is another story. And uh, Georgia is now uh, in focus. They entered only on 1st of July this year, the organization, uh, but the whole set of legislation is already prepared for them and it just has to go into inter-service consultation and into the parliament, and I hope all this will happen in the first half of next year. Um, talking about energy community at you. So, third energy package in gas, electricity, energy efficiency directive, and so on, and so on. Um, if I talk about other priorities in the region, Turkey was for some time following very closely what's happening, especially in electricity sector, they completely transposed the third energy package. They're most uh, progressive in comparison to other countries from the region. In gas, not at all. I guess is very uh, state um, um, managed, or I mean government managed. Um, but uh, after this cup, uh, when it was last year, they, they even stopped coming on the meetings, so they're completely inactive, and now they're choosing another path. Armenia is uh, also always very active, but uh, on the end, not much is happening. Um, uh, there, uh, because of uh, different hurdles, perhaps we will have time later to discuss about the details. Belarus is also now very eager to, uh, to reform at least electricity market sector, uh, because uh, gas market is anyhow in 100% ownership of Gazprom, so they cannot do much. Um, but uh, um, this is also uh, uh, a request of uh, when we are talking about Euro Asia. This is the title of the uh, uh, this round table or today's event. Uh, Euro Asian Economic Union is uh, a new fact uh, uh, which uh, and this Euro Asian Economic Union despite not being very efficient has its own acquis 
its own directives. They're not called directives like in European Union, they're called concepts. And the envisaged opening of electricity market in 2019, uh, what is important for Belarus, Armenia as well. Um, but um, of course it will not happen uh, as envisaged because uh, these countries are much less uh, eager to reform their sectors as uh, European Union member states. Um, uh, if uh, you said I should mention a few key challenges for uh, this region, I would say in Ukraine it is uh, in gas sector unbundling. Unbundling of transmission system operator doesn't progress at all. And uh, uh, now <laughs> you will perhaps laugh, but the, the biggest promoter of third energy package implementation in gas sector in Ukraine currently is Gazprom. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, there is a, an arbitration procedure in Stockholm between Naftogaz, Ukrainian um, uh, gas incumbent and Gazprom. And Gazprom uh, claims that Ukraine is not implementing third energy package. Ukraine says we do. And a few things are happening because of that. Um, but I'm afraid that after uh, this uh, arbitration will be over, which is end of uh, November envisaged, so end of this month, things will perhaps uh, get stuck again. Um, when I'm talking about unbundling, the European Union, I have to say, becomes a little bit nervous uh, because uh, uh, Ukraine is not really fully implementing third energy package. And nobody knows exactly what will happen with the transit of gas after 2019 when existing contract between Gazprom and Naftogaz expires. All these potential alternative routes will not be built yet, even if they will ever be, Nord Stream 2 and Turkish Stream. So it is of major importance that Ukraine really respects third energy package, uh, which means third party access and all other transparency rules. The second thing, but this is somehow about the radar of international community and I believe uh, there will be a happy end. Uh, but uh, the, the another thing which is below the radar is retail market. So wholesale gas market was reformed in Ukraine, it's functioning, uh, no problems, many foreign companies now being active, but retail market is completely monopolized and government even uh, prohibited competition and you have to know that 75% of this market is in ownership of Dmitro Firtas. It's a person who shall be expelled to the United States, uh, currently living in Austria. Um, and uh, the government is really defending his interests, um, I can say. Um, and uh, we are struggling together with World Bank, IMF, uh, European Union, to reform this part of the sector as well, but currently not being very successful. Um, and uh, um, if I talk uh, about Moldova, uh, 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 if I talk about electricity in Ukraine, I have to say that electricity market or Ukrainian electricity market is an important one, but somehow also below the radar uh, of international community because Ukraine is even not synchronized with the Central European um, synchronous area. So there is no trade between Europe and Ukraine. There is an agreement between European Association of Transmission System Operators and Ukraine to synchronize them in six years. But I can tell you that Turkey signed such an agreement back in 2000 and implemented it fully in 2015. So they needed 15 years and they were much better organized than Ukraine is. And uh, uh, so I don't believe that this will happen in six years. Uh, but this is an area where Ukraine would really need now a push and assistance also with American experience. Um, and so a lot of work for USAID. <laughs> um, and um, uh, this, uh, this can really be a game changer, uh, el electricity, market uh, coupling with the rest of Europe. Um, and um, 
uh, electricity market law was adopted. Uh, it should be implemented by mid 2019. Now we are assisting them in this, but I, I didn't detect all the hurdles which will become obvious, I believe, just before the reform should enter into force. Um, Moldova is in guess, uh, I mean, the, the only solution is interconnection with Romania. Uh, there is no, uh, because uh, Gazprom is complete monopolist in gas sector uh, and in electricity um, they shall start electricity trade with Ukraine uh, because they are in the same synchronous area. Uh, Georgia um, uh, is also, um, I mean, has perhaps a bright future in electricity trade with Armenia and Turkey, but it depends on Armenia and Turkey as well, not only on Georgians. Um, and the same goes for Azerbaijan. And uh, um, all countries are uh, very, very slow in the reforming of energy efficiency sector or en imposing energy efficiency measures. This is, you, you cannot believe, I mean, the directives, energy efficiency directives, there are three. Um, energy Labeling Directive, Energy Efficiency Directive, and Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. In Ukraine, everything was easier. So gas market reform, electricity market reform, at least transposition implementation is another story, but it's impossible to transpose energy efficiency directives. There is so much of resistance in this, the, the country, you cannot believe. Uh, perhaps, I mean, there's a lot of demagogy, perhaps because every housekeeper knows something about energy efficiency, and then, uh, really, uh, they really find there uh, a battlefield to fight against reforms. Um, um, uh, and a challenge is also not only in these countries, but also on the other side. It means in European Union. European Union integrated these countries as formally, they are part of internal energy market. So uh, nothing to say. But informally, the legal gap is increasing or, or getting deeper between EU and these countries. Because EU developed its internal rules uh, till, I would say, last detail. Um, uh, among them are around 20 so-called network codes uh, in gas and uh, electricity area. But EU didn't propose them to energy community contracting parties to transpose them. So this technical barriers on the border are becoming bigger and bigger. So, and you cannot have two, two types of countries in the same internal market, I mean, two legal systems, this doesn't function. So, to overcome this, we as Secretariat proposed treaty amendments to the Energy Community Treaty to further integrate energy community contracting parties with EU member states. And this process moves, but uh, in EU, um, it also, things are not going that fast as sometimes wished. Uh, so, uh, to be, I mean, there will be hopefully some questions because I don't know in which direction to go. Um, things are happening, uh, but the main, I mean, it's not easy with implement, transposition somehow functions. Implementation is another story. Uh, the biggest problem is uh, really resistance of, of interest groups, read it, corruption. Um, I would say especially in uh, Ukraine and Moldova, much less in Georgia. Um, and uh, one of the problems I have to say, we have to admit all of us here is also non-coordinated approach of all Western partners international financial institutions, European Union, Energy Community Secretariat, United States, I mean State Department, USAID, and so on and so on. We do not always speak with the same language. Sometimes we, um, you know, banks are into, banks are banks, even if they're called donors, I don't know why banks are called donors, World Bank and the EBRD and European Investment Bank um, and IMF. I mean, they're banks. Uh, they're interested in getting their money back uh, they're not, sometimes they don't care much about a key or a legal framework, legal compliance with the key. Uh, other donors like USAID, 
Kredit für Wiederaufbau with German um, Association um, and so on are sometimes interested just to spend the money which they have in their budget for technical assistance and the product is sometimes not good, um, then we have sometimes problems with the, that pro product and the country says, look, but we got this from consultants from, I don't know, somebody, I will not name. Um, it, it, it's, it's their voice, you know, and then we say, this is not functioning, I mean, it's not compliant, you know, uh, you see, and they have a limited administrative capacity in the countries. So it's, uh, I mean, we are, we are flooding them sometimes with technical assistance, um, and they are confused. Uh, so this is also a sin on the Western side, I would say, <laughs> when pushing for these reforms and uh, some better coordination. I don't know if it is possible, but would be urgently needed because also in these countries, you know, they, uh, uh, they are very happy and they, they are very skilled in, I can say, even cheating us, you know, um, uh, working with one donor, another donor, third donor, uh, uh, bringing them against each other, um, establishing working groups, subgroups, sub-subgroups, um, um, uh, immersing us into labyrinths of all these uh, procedures. And of course, if we don't cooperate with each other, well, then we are somehow lost, and a lot of taxpayers' money is lost as well. So, all these are problems. Uh, things are, uh, I'm still optimistic. <laughs> yeah, if I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be there where I am, um, but uh, it goes much slower than uh, expected some years ago. I was more optimistic some years ago than I am nowadays, but I'm I didn't become pessimistic yet. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. And I just, uh, Steve, in turning to you too, I mean, some of the issues that were raised, including the last, on, on cooperation, development cooperation, it should be noted that just I think two weeks ago, USAID uh, Energy Community signed an agreement on uh, greater cooperation, which I think is a, a positive step forward, but it's also uh, just in general on development corporate uh, cooperation international development cooperation is uh, it's incredibly challenging and it has been uh, for the US and the EU and I'm not just in the energy sector alone I think this is a challenge uh, across the board in uh, support of euro Atlantic integration whether it's in the energy sector economically abroad but you raise a couple of key topics to from corruption um, to you know sort of vested uh, vested interests in countries that are transitioning that still remain that are that hold back uh, reform uh, Steve just turning to you just to also maybe just give an overview uh, but also to you know touch on some of the things that that, that were already discussed and, and the work that you're currently doing okay well uh, thank you Jonathan and thank you uh, to director Kopach as well um, and I'm just gonna right at the start pass the buck but when you mentioned um, integrating Ukraine into the European Central Grid uh, USEA is one of our primary implementers in that regard, so I'm just passing that right on down to Will, so he can address that when, when we get to his point of the conversation. But uh, uh, with, you know, I think as most of you know, USAID is the primary uh, development assistance agency for the U.S. government. Um, I think we're more known uh, for our disaster assistance, our humanitarian assistance work. Uh, in this region, it's the, the democratization work and so on. When you think of energy assistance, Africa usually generally is the first thing to come to mind. The point I want to make is that we are still very active in the region. Uh, we have been active in the region since, since uh, uh, the 90s, the, the fall of communism, uh, and uh, we continue to. I, I think our role has changed. Uh, we uh, started with basic uh, uh, assistance provision, basic uh, uh, getting utilities back up and running, moving them to market economies, that type of work, building the capacity of the institutions and so on. You know, as we've moved on, we're seeing our role move more into uh, advanced market structure, that type of work. Uh, we do an awful lot of work with the utilities, an awful lot of work with, with uh, the regulatory agencies and whatnot. You know, 
I, I, I use a bad analogy quite often uh, when I think of how uh, we best uh, coordinate or collaborate with the Secretariat. When you look at, when you look at energy sector reform, uh, Director Kopach noted 15 years for Turkey just to, to integrate into the Central European network. Uh, I, I think 15 years was remarkable in how short of a period of time it took, right, given the distance at the start. So this is a, is a one, two, sometimes more decade-long approach to reform in energy sector. And uh, as, as the European uh, legal framework just advances and becomes more complex, uh, we have very limited absorptive capacity or implementation capacity in our countries. And where uh, the Secretary and others are very good is at that basic legal framework. So USAID will engage to some extent but the analogy I use is whereas if you're building a house, right, they're going to rough out, they're going to do the framing or rough out your plumbing, and it's USA that uh, is really good at coming in and putting in the fixtures and making it a functioning home. We're really good on the implementation side, and that's some credit to Will and his team at USEA, credit to the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. How do you actually run and govern a sector? That's the type of work that, that I think we in particular do a really good job at. So. When you look at, at, at the Black Sea region, uh, it, it, it has its, its own challenges. It's, it's to some extent, uh, I, uh, I would say, uh, uh, a border region or a buffer region between Central Europe and some uh, and more uh, unstable areas surrounding. When you look to the Caucasus, you have the Middle East and instability there. You look on the eastern border with Ukraine, Moldova, you have heightened Russian aggression in that regard. So, so it's important uh, uh, to, for us to continue working in those countries uh, to, to better integrate them into Europe, right, to, to improve that buffer, right, because we're all, both North America and Europe are better with a stable Europe. Right? So uh, the challenges that we see, I think, I think Director Kopach did a really good job uh, summarizing those. Um, what I would say in terms of donor coordination, it's, it's for us, it, it's, it's not getting enamored with the mega projects. It, it's not focusing, uh, Jonathan mentioned pipeline politics, it's not just on energy transit corridors, bringing gas to Europe. Okay? You, can, you can build the pipeline, you can, you can bring the energy supply, but if you don't have uh, the transparent market structures in place, you're just furthering oligarch control. You're just furthering uh, uh, a, a, a system that to some extent needs further reform. So, so where we, we would do a better job is that, that on the ground, uh, again, implementation, build, building it from, from the ground up. I wrote myself a couple notes because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, you know, the, the point that, that, that I also would make is when you look back to work that we did at aid in the 90s and the early 2000s, a lot of our assistance recipients then are now our partners. You look to Eastern European countries, they're working with us now. I can, I can look to utilities and regulatory agencies throughout, throughout uh, the Baltic states, uh, throughout, uh, through even uh, Slovakia, Poland, others that are working closely with us now to deliver assistance to the region. And that's what we, that's, that's really what USAID is designed to do, right, is, is to bring these countries along. You know, the other point that, that, that I make is, you know, we still have a, a role to play. So at USAID, there's, there's two things, right? So, uh, or, or two general rules that we keep, at least in the program I'm running. One is we're going to favor engagement, right, over, over uh, say, uh, a singular project, right? So it's, uh, I guess the analogy would be keeping a seat at the table, right? So we have a, a strong history in the region. We want to continue working with the countries. We will continue to work with them to the extent that we can. Okay, and the other thing, and I'm going to steal a little bit from Will on this because he articulated this once in a conversation a couple years ago, is we will do the technical and wait for the politics to catch up. Right? So uh, in that regard, I mean, it's, it's we, I, I, I do think there is room for conditioning on assistance, but where USAID works with the sector stakeholders, we need to make sure that that system can be governed even if the country isn't ready to fully integrate. Right? So the continued work with the regulators, that continued work with the energy utilities, the stakeholders in the sector, as, as the political, uh, the political structures in the country are trying to move forward. Right, so um, in general, then, uh, with, with those rules, are we, we probably have three major areas we're focusing on energy-wise. Right, it's uh, the market development. Right, so uh, the, the uh, problem that we see in the region is, is too many frozen conflicts, too much divide and conquer. Right, so the more that we can 
bring countries into a larger, well-integrated market, we see security, energy security, stemming from that. Right? It, it, it's, it's harder to isolate those into well-integrated markets. It is infrastructure development. Right? So uh, one of the issues, especially in the Eurasian countries, is as, as, as Jan has mentioned, they're not synchronously interconnected with Europe. Right? So, so that, to some extent, makes the market integration a little bit more difficult. So we want to bring these countries right, uh, from a physical infrastructure uh, perspective into Europe. Okay, and then as I'd already mentioned several times, right, it's the capacity building of the institutions. Okay, it's, it's not just enough to have uh, infrastructure projects. It's not just enough to have a legal structure. Right? It actually has to be implementable. Right? And so once you get those three together, uh, then, then you're actually moving the countries into Europe. And there's space for, for, for all donors at the table uh, and, and actually, well, the countries themselves. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second uh, Janusz's point about the need for better coordination. Uh, it's, it's, we can't do one without the other. We can't just be looking at the, at the uh, juiciest infrastructure projects or the project with the best return without addressing the other issues or we're going to continue to can continue, I think, the circle on that. And with that, I, I think I'll stop in the interest of time and maybe pass well, it on to Will. Yeah, I want to, uh, to thank the German Marshall Fund for uh, inviting me to this uh, meeting. I, I don't often get to address uh, such a distinguished group. We're working down in, uh, in the weeds. You know, we're working at the technical level. We're an implementing partner or, um, as some would say, a contractor to the office that Steve, uh, to Steve, that Steve runs at the U.S. Agency for International Development. So I'm going to give you a perspective of what it's like to be working with the actual utilities and the regulators in the field, some of the challenges they have. But just before I begin, let me uh, give an overview of who we are. Uh, I work for the United States Energy Association. We're a nonprofit membership association. Uh, we're a voluntary membership association, and our membership spans the entire breadth of the U.S. energy industry. So we have members who are uh, oil and gas companies and utilities. We also have uh, federal agencies and state regulatory agencies here in the United States. We have equipment manufacturers. We started this work in the early 1990s, or actually in the late 1980s, when USAID changed its development assistance philosophy. And earlier than uh, beginning in the sort of the 19, late 1980s, USAID changed its philosophy from one where it was supporting parastatal institutions and building infrastructure for them to one in which uh, it was seeking to seed private capital in infrastructure, particularly in energy because it realized that building and just transferring assets to developing countries meant that several years later the assets fell into disrepair because they weren't operating as commercial utilities. So USAID changed its philosophy to one where it was seeking to establish electricity markets, oil and gas markets, etc. That would enable uh, private enterprise to come in and fill the void that the governments were unable to fill so that the governments then could take the capital that they were originally providing to the energy sector and put it into areas of the economy where private capital wouldn't enter, uh, hospitals, schools, even roads. Our association got involved because we mistakenly thought that uh, our members could provide some development assistance and also find uh, business opportunities in the region. And at first they did find business opportunities and they went all around the world looking for international uh, investments as the U.S. energy industry became deregulated. But they soon found that the Europe and Eurasia region was uh, a kettle of fish that was much more difficult to navigate than they had expected and uh, turned tail and never came back. But we uh, felt as an association committed to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the cause, I'll say. And we've remained committed for the last 25 years. And I want to start the discussion with a little story to tell you that one of the most important stories of the post-Cold War era that's never told is the story of how uh, the U.S. and its European allies caused the physical disconnection of Central and Eastern European electricity networks from the Soviet network and helped them to integrate into Western European electricity grids. And in order to do that, these countries, the first four, Poland, Hungary, Czech, and Slovak republics, had to overcome a number of similar technical, legal, political, and economic challenges, or conditions precedent, as they're called in the development assistance business, in order to join the Western European grid. They had to have a certain level of frequency. They had, to in, they had to have certain environmental requirements. They had to have commercial requirements that, in, that said that they could bill and collect revenue so that they would be stable and able to be good, creditworthy partners for electricity trade. 
and through a concerted effort, uh, USAID, along with its European development partners, worked on all of these conditions precedent to the point where those four countries and later many others were able to synchronously connect. And synchronously connect is a technical term that just means physically cause the connection of uh, two electric grids that were not operating on the same wavelength to cause that to happen. And when that happened, it caused the physical then to physically disconnect from their Soviet, or the, at that point, Russian electric grid partners. That was a tremendous benefit to them for obvious reasons, for energy security purposes and for many, many other purposes that you can imagine. Now, now we're looking at 20 years later, we're replicating the process in Eurasia. But the challenges are far more difficult in Eurasia, far, far more difficult. We have 20 years of uh, more of uh, challenges to overcome. We have uh, the legacies that are far more ingrained from the socialist and centralized planning that these countries were subjected to than the Central European partners were subjected to. We have a lack of human resource capacity related to uh, markets, uh, economics, uh, civil society, uh, journalism, uh, and interven stakeholder interveners. So when we talk about the implementation of this tremendously difficult process, and we say that it's taking longer than it's to be expected, I think we're being hard on ourselves. We're putting these countries on a treadmill that's running much more quickly than we would put ourselves on. When we think about what we've done in the United States and Europe, and we've evolved over 120 years of electricity market reform, it's taken 120 years to get where we are. And we started with a democracy, and we started with civil society, and we started with markets, and an understanding of markets. And now we're asking these countries to do it within the course of 15 years or 10 years. And we have to remember, in these countries, there are winners and there are losers from this process. And some will call it corruption, but it's, they're gonna be, those guys are going to be losers, and they're not going to give it up very easily. So there's got to be a change in generations. There's got to be a growth in capacity. There's got to be a growth in information technology capacity. Because when you're talking about electricity markets, you're talking about markets that are operating at the speed of light. Electricity moves at the speed of light. It's complicated. It doesn't have storage capability like a farm. You talk about markets in a traditional economic theory. When you go to college and you go to graduate school and you learn economics, they tell you about commodity markets. They tell you about corn. And they tell you that it can be stored. And that creates a competition. You don't have that capacity in electricity. Everything is done in real time. It's very, very complicated. You need sophisticated information technology. You need market structures that root out market abuses and market monopoly. That means you need to have people who can see that it's occurring at real time. You know, regulators that can be specialists and say, I see market power and market abuse. It's, it's more than we would ever ask ourselves to do in the course of 15 years. And if we asked ourselves to do it, there would be chaos and civil disruption. So I'm proud of the work that, uh, that we're doing. We're working down in the field, at the field level. So what we're doing is creating uh, a capacity for these people to implement the, the laws that Janos is, is drafting. And it requires uh, a consensus building, slow, tedious process that sometimes is two steps forward and one step back. For example, one of the projects that Steve has, has I think with great wisdom, continued to fund after um, 16 years or 14, 12 years of operation is a project that we operate called the Black Sea Transmission Planning Project. And I'm going to just give you an example of this because it's good for you to understand what I'm talking about when I say this is the nitty gritty of development assistance. This project started in 2004 when we signed a, the Bucharest Memorandum of Understanding with six countries. It was uh, Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, Turkey, well it's actually more than six, Bulgaria and Romania. These countries, even though they border the Black Sea region, they had no way of communicating with each other uh, as to how their electricity grids would develop. Uh, they didn't have any way to plan their own electricity grids very effectively when the Soviet Union broke up. They had no software and they had no training to do it. So Steve's uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, I mean, with great wisdom, said, we're going to endow the region with a regional planning capacity so that all these countries that are connected to each other, even if they're not synchronously connected, can understand 
through the development of a, of a mathematical simulation model of their electricity grids, how an investment in one of their grids would affect the other. So if you built a generation plant in Armenia, how would the electricity flow through a connected grid to Georgia, or in Ukraine, Moldova, or Romania, Moldova? And if there weren't connections between them, how could we build them most efficiently so that we can create the robust transmission network that would enable trade to occur? Because after all, what we're really seeking to do is connect these countries with each other, can connect them with Europe to foster electricity trade, to improve overall energy security, and create a sense of dependence within the region and with Europe so that the, the region enters the Euro-Atlantic Alliance. So after many, we, we provided them with transmission planning software. We trained them on how to organize their models. The models are just these databases that are s uh, mathematical simulations. And we said, let's pretend we're going to uh, plan your network for, at that time, 2004. We were in 2004. So let's pretend we're going to do a, everybody's going to organize their own mathematical simulation model of 2010. So they put all the projects that were going to be in their network and their, on their electricity grid in 2010 in their model. We integrated the model together for all seven countries, and we gave it back to them. Well, now we had a common, we had a platform on which these countries could speak to each other and plan together. And the things that the European Union and the Energy Community Secretariat are asking them to do can now be modeled on this platform. So, for example, when Janos talks about uh, the uh, interconnection of Ukraine to Europe and the many, many uh, technical requirements that Ukraine has to make, the many, many investments that Ukraine has to make, they now have a model on which they can look at it and say, if I make this investment, will I improve the frequency uh, in Ukraine sufficiently enough that I can now, that the Europeans will accept me as a non-technical risk? Because if I join the European Union grid and I'm a technical risk, I could cause a blackout in Lisbon. Okay, that's how serious this is. And so. We now have a model. But you know that model, it takes a long time to build it. It takes a long time to give people skills to be able to manipulate it. It takes a long time for them to understand the requirements that Janos is speaking about in terms of the European Union technical requirements. So it, it, it occurs, but it occurs slowly. And if you take that and you say, not only are we doing it from a technical basis, we have to make sure that the, the, the grid is robust, strong enough, and secure enough to connect with Europe. But we now also want you to do at the same, very same time, we want you to do the same thing with markets. We want you to organize markets at the same time as you're, you're taking on this a tremendous technical task. You must make your markets the same as our European markets so that we can trade across one platform without uh, technical barriers, without legal barriers, without market barriers. You're asking them to do an awful lot with a very limited capacity. So every day, we're in the field working with these guys, and they're learning, and they're applying what we're teaching them. And we're seeing things that we never thought possible occur. And I think one of the, the really great things that Steve's office does is it allows us the freedom to uh, imagine uh, things that currently don't seem possible. So we'll, we're proposing now, we're working on our next year's work plan to uh, do a system adequacy study for the entire region, and this means looking ahead 15 years and saying, in 15 years, will your transmission network be, be sufficiently robust to incorporate high levels of renewable energy? Will it be sufficient enough to support electricity trade among yourselves and Europe? And if not, what do we need to do to help you get there? And right now, if you ask them that, it would be, they would, their eyes would glaze over and they would say, we'll, we'll never get there, we can't, it's impossible. But with this model and with these technical, this technical assistance, they can begin to see it slowly. And so things that we said five, five years ago to do, for example, building a, uh, 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 a connection between Armenia and Georgia, which is now being discussed um, in a real way with uh, financing from uh, the Germans. And even though it's slowed down a little bit, it looks like it's going to happen. We proposed to do that five years ago, and now, in, through our studies, proved it technically capable and that economically it made sense and now it's happening. So we're seeing great progress. We're seeing tremendous benefit to the region. If we let up now, we're going to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. We're almost there. 
We're almost there, and uh, through better coordination, through a, a, a more focused effort, and, um, and, and staying with it, we're going to help these people in the Eurasia region end the potential next century of tyranny and join the Euro-Atlantic Alliance. It's just going to take a lot more effort to get there. Well, thank you. Uh, I think you highlighted some of the uh, some of the key challenges, but also the importance of 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 how long this process takes <coughs> with your experience and and the importance of sticking to it. And I think uh, in terms of the energy uh, sector and discussions here in Washington, assistance levels um, highlights a point that I think that uh, a lot of people are making, which is uh, keep these resources flowing. They have, you know, these projects take, and efforts take a long time. Uh, one of the concerns I always had at USA too is that you'd have this, you know, quick cutoff of funding, and then you would have pro ongoing projects that are progressing. Uh, you'd have funding drop out, and you wouldn't have the resources. So, Giannis, you pointed out the you know, the, the point about uh, wasting or the potential to do that or lack of coordination, um, and I think this is just that it's it's critical. Uh, that it happened, but I also wanted to make sure that we're connecting why it's so important uh, for those people. You know, we have, a, I think, a very diverse group that comes from across different parts of this uh, of the energy sector and industry, in trying to make a connection and how all of this fits in with uh, those who are looking at you know uh, pipelines itself. Uh, that you need to have one uh, to do the other, and they all fit together to uh, to make up this important landscape. So with that said, um, we're going to open up uh, the floor to question and answer. Please identify yourself, uh, who you're with, uh, and uh, please try to uh, keep uh, your, your uh, comments short and, and to the point and to, uh, to a question as well. And uh, as moderator, I just wanted to maybe open up to address some of the, these challenges and trends and ask uh, obviously, in, in Washington, there's a great deal of focus today on, on Russia, and uh, and that that's for a number of uh, a number of different directions from disinformation. Uh, but one of the areas that uh, we found and others find most disconcerting is the is the, the direct um, attacks on energy infrastructure in in the region, particularly in Ukraine. And I'm wondering, uh, both from the energy community, but also uh, from USAID, well, uh, from your end too, uh, how you see uh, what what could be done to prevent uh, such cyber attacks? What are you doing now uh, from the government side? Uh, Steve, I know USAID and you've been long engaged uh, in this issue. And what, what should we be doing with partners, particularly partners that are still going through the types of transition that make them uh, particularly vulnerable to these types of attacks, let alone our own uh, our own vulnerability in the United States and across Europe. So I know it's a it's a wide topic, but it's one that uh, is uh, is gained greater attention here. And because you're working really both at at a higher level, but also right at the grassroots level, um, how should uh, how should we be addressing this challenge? And what are you uh, what are you doing from your uh, prospective positions to address these issues. Okay. Um, here, <coughs> it would be fair that Steve starts because United States are here much more uh, advanced than European Union, I would say. Um, and USAID is, is active in the region in at least uh, trying to persu persuade uh, energy regulators um, to dedicate a, a piece of tariff in uh, uh regulated activities uh, uh, for, for this, uh, I mean, for the cybersecurity uh, expenses. Um, what is, uh, here uh, we are, I mean, this cybersecurity became an issue not that long ago. I mean, it, it's now, let's say, fashionable for last one, two, three years only. In the United States, perhaps you had it uh, on the agenda much earlier. I don't know, but the uh, European Union is currently in a very complicated process of amending the whole set, uh, so more than 100 directives and regulations 
in the energy sector and the, the, the whole package is called so-called clean energy package. It goes into this, let's say, climate, I mean, uh, it's uh, being adapted. The third energy package plus many other directives are being currently adapted to follow so-called 2030 targets related to climate issues and, and renewables and so on and so on. So it's a very complicated process in inside European Union and cybersecurity was somehow not in the early beginning part of this big process. So now the whole European Union is busy with, I mean energy world in European Union is busy with dealing with clean energy package. Um, and uh, uh, cybersecurity is not such an issue in Western Europe. It's a bigger issue in Central and in Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, this is why it was a little bit not forgotten, uh, now it is discussed, but it was not remi uh, remembered early enough. Uh, and uh, uh, now we, we, s we feel, uh, an, let's say, a gap or a need to have some rules related to cybersecurity in particularly in this region. So uh, if we go from north to south, Poland, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, this part and east. So it means towards Ukraine, Moldova and so on. So there is one possibility, Secretariat is now discussing it, to adopt special rules only for this region. So a new type of a key. Um, related to cybersecurity, this is possible under energy community treaty because EU is also member of the energy community and the treaty allows something like this, such an, uh, uh, let's say, separated approach. Um, but we all need to develop uh, proper expertise uh, inside institutions, so European institutions and inside countries. Um, and. Uh, uh, that's it. So uh, there is a legal gap because these things have to be also regulated. It's not enough only to have knowledge. Um, uh, it's not enough only to have money to deal with IT. Uh, it uh, things also need to be regulated. Um, so this is still in front of us. I didn't uh, give a clear answer when and how it will happen, uh, but we are working on it. But. Uh, still is um, more on a battlefield. Uh, so uh, before I start, I, what I would say is that our colleagues at uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, Department of Justice are, are far more attuned to cyber issues than we are at USAID and we're trying to draw heavily on their experience uh, and, and to work with them closely. Um, what, what we uh, are looking at in terms of cyber in, in the region is it's just you know uh, uh, another form of aggression, and and I can't call it just a distractor because it's gone beyond that. Um, you know, as Will mentioned, uh, it's incredibly complex to, to to balance the power system. I mean, we're throwing markets at them with with uh, lightning speed flow of information, and so these vulnerabilities exist throughout every everything that we're doing. Uh, so. At, at USAID at least, our, our, our thought is in looking at the region, in looking at utilities that are struggling just to maintain day-to-day -day operations, you know, let alone consider more advanced threats, uh, is to, to get this into the corporate consciousness and to find basic practices, uh, the things that can, can Im improve. I don't want to get into specifics, but if you go into the substation attacks in Ukraine, those were all very preventable from from just very basic uh, um, uh, best practices that could be applied. Um, one of the requirements for these countries moving into the European Union or moving in, not into it, but uh, addressing the Energy Community Treaty requirement is, is a network development front. So uh, an important part for us is as you are upgrading your networks, as you're moving to more automated control, don't do it twice. Right. The first time, think about the cyber standards that you want to be putting into your systems. Right. Think about the, the, the needs that you're going to have. Think about how to approach your regulatory agencies. Right. You're going to have to recoup these investments. Right. And we have a region where power prices are kept low right, as a matter of political favor. Right. So it's a hard sell sometimes to 
uh, come and ask for, for costs to be recouped in an issue that isn't necessarily in the consciousness. So it's, it's again, this continued development, this continued um, bottom-up uh, approach to, to try to make sure that, you know, just yet one other threat is being dealt with while we have everything else in terms of moving in, in, into the EU and, and so on. Unless you have anything you'd like to add there, Bill. I think both of our panelists have kind of uh, said a lot of what I wanted to say. I think the, the most important thing uh, is uh, that in this region, situational awareness, believe it or not, is still a challenge. Because uh, if you haven't been attacked, it's not a high priority for you. You think it's going to happen to someone else. And if you want to get your utility to be uh, uh, cyber, to improve its cyber security posture, you've got to engage your senior management. If, it hasn't, if you haven't been attacked, your senior management probably is fighting a lot of alligators off in the swamp. As Steve said, it's fighting uh, issues related to market reform. It's trying to meet these technical requirements. It's dealing with corruption. It's dealing with subsidies. It's dealing with lack, uh, deferred maintenance. And cybersecurity, if you haven't been attacked, doesn't, doesn't rank as one of the top priorities. But it's going to come to you. It's going to come to you. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So what we're working on is we, we Steve and I have launched a new uh, cybersecurity working group uh, in Eurasia where we're trying to uh, get to the seniors to tell the senior management, this is what's coming your way. We need to get uh, a strategy in place, and we're trying to give them, we're giving them tools to assess their cybersecurity posture. Steve mentioned uh, the Department of Energy and its laboratories have had, had a worldwide leadership in this area, and we're trying to transfer tools that enable utilities to take a first cut and assess their cybersecurity posture. Once they've been able to do that, they'll be able to write a roadmap for uh, how to improve it. You know, they can select certain domains. We call them domains. These are management areas related to cybersecurity. And they can prioritize them based on where they see their vulnerability. When they do that, we'll help them write a network development plan that Steve mentioned, which is an actual, which is a plan that says, by a certain time, I'm going to have this equipment on my network. I'm going to install these policies and procedures. I'm going to take it to the regulator. I'm going to show them that with these investments, we're going to be more secure and ask the regulator to secure the investments in the tariff. So it's a long-term process, but I think the first step is just achieving situational awareness among the, uh, the utility management. Thank you. And I think it, you, you know, it was always a worst case uh, nightmare thinking about uh, you know, uh, the impact on cyber attacks in Ukraine as the United States, Europe, and others are trying to support the transition post Maidan, that you would have the impact economically um, let alone the impact on reforms in the sector. Uh, so struggling economies, struggling transition countries are, you know, are vulnerable to hybrid warfare. We know that. But uh, it's important that we be thinking about how do we bolster uh, and strengthen the capacity uh, at the very local level, at the ground level, to uh, address these challenges. Because often it will be somebody at a substation, uh, maybe perhaps, uh, depending on the modeling, uh, who's going to be addressing challenges. Why don't we do this? Let's open up uh, the conversation to uh, everyone who's participating here today. Please raise your hand, and somebody will be around with a, a microphone. Hi, good morning. I'm Brenda Schaefer from um, Georgetown University. Two questions to Mr. Burns. One, can you tell us the current level of U.S. assistance to the Black Sea countries for uh, energy market reform, and how does that compare with previous uh, years, if you have the data? And second, before USAID embarked on uh, massively or, or significantly supporting mar energy market reforms on the basis of the third energy package um, to the Black Sea countries, did it take any comprehensive study about what the meaning of transplanting third energy package which is within, primarily within, uh, I mean, within U EU member countries with, str with strong rule of law, strong institutions, um, where even by EU commission reports um, to the commission itself, its own internal reports after almost a decade of liberalization, prices of Europe, of gas, electricity have not gone down, market is more centralized, fuel mix is more de import dependent and higher more higher dependent on Russia. Most markets have not succeeded in diversifying this, despite all the efforts taking this package transplanting it to countries where most of them don't control their borders, have Russian forces uh, uh, deployed in, in these countries, um, weak rule of law, 
um, and very little precedence of, of uh, local versus national government on, on, on energy, energy law. Okay, let me address, that was a lot. So let me, let me address the, let me, let, let me address the, the, the first part uh, f uh, first. And uh, uh, Janish wanted to address the second. So I'll pass to him and then when I'm transitioning in my mind then I can uh, think to my response there. Uh, so on the first part with respect to budget, without getting into specific numbers, what I can say is for uh, the past uh, maybe decade or so, our budget in the region uh, has been relatively stable. Uh, so in spite of, of, of rhetoric uh, to the contrary. Um, uh, USAID, I think in terms of energy support overall, uh, has, has uh, refocused a lot to Africa. But uh, we are no longer in the transition uh, that we were in the 90s. We're no longer immediately post-war uh, in the Balkans. So obviously the budget levels have come down, but uh, they, they stabilized at, at uh, a level that we've been keeping forward. and. Um, uh, Congress earlier this year also put forward a supplemental for countering Russian influence that has benefited the program. The, uh, so I would I would answer th that question with that. Um, with regard to the second, do you want to want to start and then I'll, I'll jump in. Third energy package. Uh, you mentioned some critics uh, inside the EU about the effectiveness of it, but I, I will try to illustrate this with two free cases. So. Uh, third energy package is all about competition um, and uh, uh, European Union has energy policy has uh, fashionable trends as well you know some years uh, competition is fashionable some years sustainability is fashionable some years uh, security of supply is fashionable and all these waves in, in uh, uh, el energy policy design are somehow interfering with each other so uh, third energy package is uh, a result of some years of or uh, of a wave of um, uh, fashion of competition and i think it is very successful but of course it um, uh, conflicts with some other uh, legal solutions which come out of the area uh, of the years of fashion of sustainability or out of the years of fashion of security of supply um, uh, but in general it functions very well um, uh, when we talk about uh, electricity, the prices came down very much, uh, n not for final consumers, but for, uh, uh, I mean, the prices of generation went down enormously in the last years in European Union. And um, uh, the same trend is slowly coming into energy community contracting parties as well. Um, final price for, for consumers didn't went out, um, didn't went down because European U Union is massively supporting renewable energy sources, and this of course has to be paid by electricity consumers. And but this will, on the long run, this will, I mean, this decrease of prices will happen as well. Um, in, when we talk about gas, uh, gas became, I mean, competition in gas markets uh, increased incredibly in last. Le even not 10 years, last five years in European Union. And uh, this was all because of I new small interconnections, not big pipelines. You know, uh, politicians are still crazy about talking about big pipelines, big projects, to have big ribbons to, to cut. But wha what helps are these small, uh, um, uh, not very uh, sexy interconnections uh, which really increased the market, uh, uh, the competition on the market. And um, uh, this happened massively in European Union because of legal, uh, I mean because of a key which now imposes this and because of uh, some political decisions. Uh, uh, let's illustrate with few of them. Uh, Lithuania built uh, LNG terminal and uh, before that Gazprom had a complete monopoly and the price went down for 22% over the night of gas just because of this when this LNG terminal was finalized. Uh, and why? I mean, Russians are, uh, are behaving uh, competitive if there is a competition, but if there is no competition, they, they squeeze the uh, customer as much as they can. Um, uh, then, uh, for example, next case um, is uh, uh, prices of Russian gas are 
if you look on, on the statistics, they're the highest in Eastern Europe, and then slowly they go down towards Western Europe. Sometimes I, I joke and I say, if they would export gas to uh, uh, towards New York, it would be for free. Um, because uh, where there is more competition, they adapt, you know. Uh, so the, the countries which pay the highest price for Russian gas are countries where Gazprom has complete monopoly. Uh, and uh, so on and so on. And another case, uh, now about third energy package. When I was director of directorate, um, my staff was, all, I mean, Slovenia was always the case with the highest retail prices of gas in European Union. And I said, but it's impossible. And I was asking my, my colleagues in the ministry, how do you, they said, no, no, it's a stat statistical mistake. European Union is, is reporting this wrongly, you know? And then, wha uh, what, and then, uh, because we had 16 traders on the market, and then later it came out, then when the 17th one came, and he was a real competitor, the prices dropped for one third, 33, 35% in a month. Uh, why? Because this 16, it came out later, were discussing the prices among themselves on a secret place in a restaurant uh, from time to time, and they were sharing the market, you know. So competition really helps. Uh, and third energy package is about competition, and of course there are problems in some markets in European Union, but in general it functions very well, and I think that European Union is very happy to have this third energy package, and we as secretariat are very happy to export it <laughs> to our contracting parties. But of course, there, are, as, uh, as you can see from this case, uh, from my personal experience, uh, uh, law transposition is not enough, full implementation is important. So I think what, what I would add to that is the world isn't static. And so I think part of what I was, I was trying, trying to understand in your question is, so we've been at this for a while and we still haven't achieved the supply diversity that we're hoping to get and, and given the difficulty of implementation, kind of some, some discussion on that. And the third energy package is, in, is incredibly complex and you're working on a fourth now, correct? Yeah. At, at the EU, so, so um, and, and it, it, is, it, it is a heavy lift for the countries we're in. But what I would say is if we look to uh, Russia, it is not static. So uh, there has continues to be efforts to use uh, energy as, as a manipulator. Uh, there is uh, uh, energy uh, supply concerns that are a big player in terms of politics, Armenia, Moldova, other places. So, so looking at the third energy package, even though it's complex, it, it is – Diversity of supply isn't necessarily just fuel source, right? It's supplier, right? So uh, we are starting to see more LNG terminals, right, as a potential counterweight to gas supply. Okay, um, uh, be you in favor or not, just the renewable energy requirements in, in Europe, right? There's an alternative electric supply there. So, so that's part of what's embedded in, in the requirements, and it is a heavy lift, but it's, it's a pathway that we have forward to try to diversify if not just the, the specific technology, but, but the supplier themselves. Uh, bundle, <laughs> not on bundle, bundle a few questions, uh, you know, and that way we'll get everybody in because I want to make sure that we keep, uh, keep the trains running on time. So I know there's a question in the back, and if anybody else has any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware. And my question is about the Black Sea uh, as an ecological region, apart from, of course, the political aspects, you know, this, the sea as an entity could potentially be an avenue for more uh, diplomacy based on science and environmental issues as well. And I'm wondering if, given the current dynamics uh, with Russia, um, has there been still some effort to engage at that level uh, either through uh, USAID uh, science-based channels or on the technical side uh, with the uh, energy industry as well uh, so that there is perhaps a, a door opening in, in that capacity. Another hand in the back to raise. Hi there, I'm with uh, OFIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation with the US government. and. Um, 
you know, we are, you know, one of our key priorities is energy security for Eastern Europe. And the way we work is with private sector companies to catalyze the capital in these markets. Uh, I know you guys mentioned a lot of effort from these governments to privatize uh, and, and allow private sector ownership. For OPEC to really engage, we need 51% ownership from the private sector. And, you know, I know uh, countries like Ukraine, for instance, are doing some of their auctions of the natural gas field. Um, are we hear that like Poland, for instance, is not really amenable to uh, sort of private sector ownership. So I guess, you know, we're curious as to where we can leverage our tools in Eastern Europe to promote, you know, this common goal. Um, and, and if there are specific projects that we can engage in in Eastern Europe, uh, whether it's small ones or connectors, we'd love to, to dig in and, and, and be a part of that solution. I can start. Um, so to, to the first question with regard to, to science in, in, in the Black Sea region, I would say that um, uh, prior to uh, the Maidan, we actually were engaging with uh, Russia. USA was engaging with Russia on certain, certain, certain science-based activities, at least through the agency. Uh, as you know, um, uh, maybe five years ago now the relationship ended, uh, the official relationship. I'm looking at Jonathan. I think. Is, I, I can't remember the date, but uh, so uh, uh, at least from AIDS perspective, um, there is not necessarily uh, or regrettably we don't have as much engagement as, as perhaps we would like. Um, I, I'll look to others to, to add to that. Um, to uh, our, our colleague from OPIC, um, first of all, let's talk after out in the hall because I, I think we've, we've got some, some projects we could, we could bring you in on. Um, but uh, to, to a, a point, third-party access in, in, in the power sector, at least, or maybe even, even the gas sector, is a big issue in the region. Right? You've got embedded interests that are, that are working to, to prevent uh, third-party supply. Uh, a lot of that is the genesis of, of the third package and so on, right? trying, trying to unbundle some of these embedded entities to allow, to allow um, alternative ownership structures um, and prevent uh, a bias towards uh, the quasi-monopolistic national generators and such. So um, this is an issue we continue to try to untangle. We're seeing projects develop. We're seeing projects where there, where there are interested investors. Will had mentioned that, uh, that Western investors uh, uh, ran and have never come back. We're starting to get the hints of interest again, uh, at least from here in the United States, and we'd like to encourage that. But we want to get it to a more sustainable footing as opposed to just, just individual one-offs on a country-by-country -country basis. I don't know if you all have anything you want to add. I think what Steve says is correct. And uh, we're, we're starting to see the success of the reforms where um, third-party access where the through the creation of independent transmission system companies and now from the unbundling at the distribution level uh, where supply and the wires function are being unbundled is opening space for independent power producers, uh, whether they be smaller, smaller companies who are looking at uh, low voltage uh, projects on the distribution side, or you know large you know renewable energy developers who are looking at it uh, at the on the transmission level, and and, and that's that's the, those are the green shoots that we're seeing, and I think Steve is right. We're beginning to see the more risk tolerant uh, Western companies come back to the region because of the reforms that have uh, been successfully implemented in, in so many of these countries. Um, I have something about investments. Um, you know, in electricity sec power sector, uh, uh, okay, Moldova doesn't have practically any power plants, but Ukraine has too many. So there is not much space for new investments. I mean, of course, many of them have to be um, restructured uh, because of environmental issues, especially in coal power plants. Um, but I believe the owner, uh, anyhow, uh, again, around 75% of all coal, coal power plants is in ownership of one person, uh, Mr. Ahmeto. He will have to deal with this by himself, I believe. Of course, uh, perhaps he will need some foreign partners uh, but uh, if we talk about renewables, which are now, let's say, the most uh, uh, lively area of investments, 
Ukraine is currently a golden mine, you know, but this will not last. I mean, th this is not very healthy. Uh, their, um, their subsidy, feed-in tariff for uh, solar panel, uh, electricity from solar panels is 150 euros per megawatt hour. So let's say $170, something like this. I mean, this is, it's crazy. Currently in, in Germany, which, is, which has much less sun, this is 60 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, you know, the, the country will bankrupt if they will have more investments. And of course, there is plenty of interest for investments. But then what happens? That the state somehow, through non very transparent approaches, tries to cool down <laughs> the interest <laughs> of, uh, uh, of in for investments because um, they will bankrupt otherwise. Uh, so this needs to be adapted in an economically sustainable way, not, not environmentally sustainable, because renewables are environmentally sustainable. And uh, 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 the problem in Ukraine is that all this is envisaged in the law, and they cannot change the law. You know, all other countries around the world are adapting this in secondary legislation, which government then adapts from time to time. Uh, but in Ukraine, everything has to be in the law, and this as well, uh, and it's a big problem. So, I mean, th it's not an answer, uh, but uh, oh, the third thing which I wanted to say, uh, all these countries are desperately needing investments into infrastructure, which can be profitable on the long run, very much. Uh, I'm very sorry that nobody from West bought uh, Moldovan transmission system operator and now Gazprom is uh, majority owner. Um, Ukraine didn't want to sell anything, uh, but they desperately need investments. Um, so I would say not, don't look that much into production uh, or generation. Uh, infrastructure, I think, is more uh, compelling and uh, better on the long run. Just look at Chinese. I mean, they're trying to buy infrastructure all around Europe now uh, because it's a long-lasting uh, rent-bringing uh, investment which will never end. Uh, generation comes and goes, uh, but infrastructure remains. Can I just add one point to that? It kind of circled us back around to the beginning, right? It's it's interesting to talk about billion, two billion dollar power plants. It's interesting to talk about mega pipelines and so on. Right? Uh, the Eurasian countries tend to be energy rich. They're, they're just more politically hampered than, than actual resource hampered. But it is the infrastructure, it's the underlying infrastructure that is the investment need. It's the, the refurbishing of the existing power plants. It's the, it's the connect, it's the, the, inter the smaller gas interconnectors. It's the uh, uh, electric power grid. Like th those are areas where there's significant investment need and there's actually profit to be had right but but it's it's not as fun to focus on as some of these big mega deals that, that you always hear about in the press right um, let's take uh, two more questions any additional questions yes we'll, we'll take here and here go ahead yeah this is question to mr. college uh, 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 um, uh, this third, third energy energy package that is uh, the certain requirements uh, that is uh, applied to Russian Gazprom on in Eastern and, and Western Europe, are those requirements are going to apply to uh, partner countries for uh, energy uh, contracting parties of, of energy co uh, community? And uh, in general, if are you considering? Uh, uh, more sort of conditional. We've heard about how Uk Ukraine was asked to join, actually, or demanded to join energy energy uh, community. Uh, are there any considerations of Russia to be not joined, but maybe played more rule-based uh, game in, in, uh, on gas and other, other uh, industries as well? Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Vlad Muzirev, Embassy of Ukraine. Actually, it's not a more like a question, but like a comment. Because, uh, yes, uh, we would like to see uh, more faster progress in energy reforms in Ukraine, but uh, frankly speaking, 
it's extremely fast. We are just uh, less than three years in these reforms and we've already achieved more than most of the countries during the same period of time. So we are in the IMF program and actually uh, energy reform is one of the key uh, reforms uh, from the IMF. So, and we have succeeded. So I guess it's uh, quite difficult to uh, say that uh, we are like uh, too slow in that. Uh, sh sure, it's an extremely complicated question and you are correct that uh, it's impossible to make in two years. So sometimes it's take 15 years like in, uh, like in Turkey. But uh, we are in uh, reforms, in energy reforms, and uh, that's extremely important for us. Thank you. Uh, if I can comment first, the uh, Ukraine, I mean, r really, um, the Ukrainian nation as a whole is, is really paying uh, a big price of all these reforms. And um, I mean, uh, I really feel all, uh, I mean, all positive emotions with, with these reform processes. But we have to be honest, in Ukraine are good guys and bad guys, like in any other, every other country. There are reform forces in Ukraine, I, I won't name them now, but uh, recently uh, we prepared a list of good guys and bad guys in the electricity market, uh, but we didn't distribute it. Uh, uh, and, but there are very strong opponents, also Ukrainians. Of course, somebody said these are people who will perhaps not be um, winners uh, of these reforms and they are strongly opposing. Um, processes are going on and at least I have to say, I mean, compared to other contracting parties, today we are talking about Black Sea region, but we have also Western Balkan six countries. If I talk, there is Serbia, which is usually praised as the most progressive and so on. But if I compare reforms in gas sector in Serbia or in Ukraine, it's completely black and white story. I mean, in, in Serbia, everything is stuck. Uh, Ukraine is, you know, moving two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. At least many things are happening, that's good. Um, but um, uh, about Russian gas uh, and influence, perhaps I didn't understand the whole uh, uh, scope of a question, but uh, European Union uh, has a, a, a little bit of a problem. It's uh, together with energy community uh, countries, contracting parties, because third package is now relevant on this territory, but not on the territory outside EU or on the board. Not, it's not completely clear what is happening on the border of EU. <laughs> and this is the problem of Nord Stream 2, um, where now Commission decided that despite there is a legal uh, vacuum, they will anyhow still insist on getting a mandate of European Council to negotiate uh, Nord Stream 2 because they feel that there is that the gap has to be filled somehow with something. So this third energy package is not completely 100% waterproof or gas proof, I would say, um, and it needs uh, some additional um, efforts. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, perhaps I didn't understand, but this is... Uh Yeah, yeah, the third energy package is in uh, implement, uh, tra but transposed. Yes, that, that's the, the, the whole purpose of energy community. Uh, as a, let's say, if I, I, if I, if I don't say it very humble, it's a European energy diplomacy on a battlefield. Stephen Will, do you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just, uh, uh, two points. I, I think you had uh, mentioned, well, do we foresee uh, Russia as a, as a trading partner or a, a value trading partner on, uh, as the third energy package develops? And I, I was absolutely yes. I mean, we, we've talked a bit about uh, Russian influence or, or r Russian aggression during the conversation today, but everything that we're doing is law-based, is rules-based, right? Because we, we would like to see a time five, ten years downstream where where there's, it's, it's 
uh, not the battlefield per se, right? But it, it is it is more energy diplomacy, and and so it's just having the the, the, the structures in place, um, and and then just uh, in in a response to uh, to the gentleman from Ukraine, uh, I would say you know we, we applaud your efforts. Uh, the, there's a, a a lot changing. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, institutional momentum against change, and so it is going to be challenging. And and I, I would say we're we're here to stand by you to 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 work through it. Like that's that that's part of our function. I think both of our institutions. Uh, so uh, I would I would leave it at that. I don't know Will if you. So why don't we do this? We we are um, a little bit over time, and what I'd love to have happen right now is maybe just closing. Uh, thoughts, and we can start with Will and, and come all the way down on this. And I just want to say to our Ukrainian uh, embassy uh, friend uh, that it's not lost on anybody that not only is the energy sector reform taking place, but reform across a, a number of sectors with a hot war in the East, um, uh, economic uh, disaster averted uh, shortly after uh, the new president came uh, to power. So I think we, we understand there's context here, but I think the point being is the continued push forward in this sector is going to be critical to Ukraine economically, uh, politically, uh, its, its democracy and anti-corruption fight. And so this work uh, needs to continue, but it, we understand that it will take time uh, for it to take place. So why don't we start, uh, Will, on your end, closing, closing points. Well, I'll just return to the theme that I introduced earlier, which is that we're seeing uh, a lot of green shoots in, in terms of Indicators. I think you, we're beginning to see uh, investment coming back. I think of the, the the hydropower plants that we're seeing in Georgia that are being constructed there for trade with Turkey, uh, a growing and, and burgeoning electricity market in Turkey. And we are seeing that because the interconnector it was put in place between Georgia and Turkey. And Georgia began a process of opening up its electricity market to enable uh, a wholesale trade and trade with Turkey. Uh, if G Armenia uh, does the builds the interconnector with uh, with Georgia that that's being discussed, we'll begin to see uh, ground you know sort of grassroots investor interest there as well, for and we'll see electricity traders and suppliers begin to take advantage of uh, of arbitrage situations between the country's uh, prices of power during different times of the year when Georgia has hydro and when it doesn't. When nuclear, uh, when Armenia has its nuclear, and when it's taking its nuclear power plant down for um, refurbishment, so uh, you know, as Steve and Yana said, maybe um, these interconnector projects aren't the, the most sexy or glamorous projects, but they're providing the uh, the space and the infrastructure and the superhighway for this uh, integration and trade, and not only trade within the region, but as uh, Turkey. Uh, reduces this, the congestion within its own grid uh, and becomes the linchpin between the Black Sea and the Balkans, we'll see more in, intra-regional trade. And I think now is uh, the time to, to continue to pursue these reforms, even though they're painful and difficult for the countries that uh, are having to implement them. Uh, we're seeing the success and we need to keep, keep at it. I would just build on what Will said. Uh, we focused a little bit on some some of the negatives today, but you know, l l looking to the positives, uh, you know, in the Caucasus, Georgia has been a leader, at least from an energy sector, in terms of looking westward, integrating into Turkey and whatnot. And, it, and it's a pool. Its neighbors are looking to that as well and wanting to benefit. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan are looking to Georgia as as potential uh, uh, um, uh, a transit corridor or a place to export power to. So we, we, we see that, we, we, we see the fruits of, of, of the local labor there in, in terms of improving the energy sector. Uh, you, you look to Ukraine. Uh, it, it hasn't been smooth, but who would expect it to be smooth with, with, with uh, uh, a war in the east? So uh, I, again, kind of that, that, that westward orientation, looking to Europe, looking to more stable market structures. So um, uh, while there, there, there is work to be done, uh, and and I, uh, I use a word Will uses sometimes to to to, to describe as a Pollyanna, right? Uh, no, that's no, that's that's not the case. There's a lot of work to be done, but uh, let's just take stock of of the progress that has been made, and and know that we need to keep working at it, and uh, we'll keep working at it at eight. And our secretariat is is a critical partner in this, and uh, stop there. Um, 
I somehow some summarized my <laughs> my my appearance here in the beginning when I said that I am less optimistic than I used to be, but I'm still optimistic. Uh, but uh, for for the end, I would like to say um, only that uh, energy uh, is for Eastern partnership or let's say all Eastern countries. Um, I'm talking about Western Balkans as well. Um, it's uh, the the major political battle. So in Ukraine, for example, we, we uh, only knowing the energy policy and energy developments in the last uh, 15 years can explain not only the modern history of Ukraine, because all oligarchs are in energy sector, uh, this and or that way, and of course they are creating the life of Ukraine, but it's also about the modern history of Europe of last 15 years or 20 years. So I hope once I will have time, <laughs> perhaps with somebody else, perhaps somebody is there interested in the audience, to write a, a really uh, uh, extensive or intensive book about the modern history of <laughs> Europe, uh, which will be all related directly or indirectly to energy policy issues in Eastern partnership countries, especially in Ukraine. Uh, it's really an exciting uh, era in which we are living, and I hope it will have a happy end. Well, thank you so much. I, if, if you could all join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs> We're going to uh, have our next panel coming up, uh, so please stick around. And, uh, and thank you again for, for coming early this morning on a Monday. <laughs>